Hello, so um, hi, I'm Andrew Lowell. I'm going to do the Houdini Tech Deep Dive. And so that was explained to me basically that we have uh, quite a few people interested in learning about effects, learning about Houdini. And uh, this is really exciting for me because uh, even though it's virtual, I did get a chance to go to India for three weeks in Mumbai and, and train studios and schools. That was a great time and I'm glad to be here today and and show uh, you know 10 years after the fact because I remember the demos I was doing back then uh, is quite a bit simpler because uh, Houdini was simpler and we're going to do similar demos today and what I'm going to try to do is there's going to be some people maybe they're a little bit advanced throw in a few things for you guys um, overall if you're just getting into the software uh, maybe even a junior artist you're looking at how the software is really used even for simple effects uh, then I'm going to try to highlight that. And then finally, uh, what I want to do is if you're a production studio, so if you're a big studio, you're like, well, uh, the investment in Houdini is, is really difficult. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of learning curve. And how can I justify uh, kind of getting more Houdini use at my studio? Because right now there's only two or three people that that might know it to a certain level. How do I get my entire staff really using it productively or efficiently, or at least a big part of, of the staff? So here I wanna just, let's start in. All right, so uh, Houdini is very scary. I teach uh, many schools and, and things, and it's, you know, everyone has a certain fear around it. Uh, you might be coming from Maya, Blender, 3D Studio Max. So first to start off with, um, let's let me just show some renders here. All right, here's what I'll be demonstrating today. All right, so we have really what I consider to be the strength of Houdini. So you can see effects first of all. Uh, so here I have three very different kind of effects that I put together for this demonstration. We have some sci-fi effects, we have some groundbreaking and, and cracking realistic effects, and we have some, some of these fun animated plant growth effects. Okay, so first of all, Houdini can be very good at effects in natural phenomena, and of course it's making huge inroads into other areas. But more so than that, the more subtle thing you might notice here is that I've got the same, what I'd call catalyst, uh, catalyst is something that causes action. So I've got this ball rolling down the hill. And that's with a simulation, of course. So we've got the ball rolling down the hill. And it's not just doing one thing. So any catalyst can be applied procedurally. I didn't have to remake the simulation to do this. I didn't have to remake the simulation to do this. If I were to change the simulation, which we'll demonstrate in a second, uh, change the catalyst, then all of the simulations will change. So you can see the advantage of getting a system, even though it takes longer maybe to engineer the system than with a plugin uh, for an easier software. Uh, it takes longer up front, but then we can iterate and iterate and iterate. And so every time, every shot, we get this kind of effect or in the next movie or the next uh, musical or the next uh, TV series, we get this next kind of effect. We can not only do the same effect again, but we can keep making it better. We can keep updating it while someone else is just working on it and applying the catalyst. So, so we'll just hide those. Okay, so on the surface, uh, this looks a lot like, uh, even though it doesn't look like it here, it looks a lot like Maya or another uh, kind of animation package. So here, I've got the same things we'd find in the object area of these other programs. We've got uh, environment light, a key light, a backlight, and I've got a camera. Okay, and uh, I've just got a few objects that I probably would import from another program. So I've got the sphere, pretty simple, and I've got a ground. So say that's our starting point. We have like 50 shots to do in a, in a film. And we just get different things that are dropping and we get different terrains. So that would be where I'd be used to starting in an effect in a pipeline. In fact, I have started from about that point 
in some some major effects in major movies. Okay, so so that part that's pretty easy. Even though in other programs it might be a big list or something, or you might just be able to select it, which of course you can here. But people don't really work so much with clicking and and stuff like that. That's not really how it's done. It's really done by almost a very scientific big system of organization. Okay, so say we get this in and we get this in. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, first of all, uh, the system will flow down to another place. All right, so here I say, okay, I wanna keep this stuff away from, my, from my, my good work here. And here, I'm just bringing in something from somewhere else. And it's just getting cut up and um, up -rezzed. And I've got a different pattern on it. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a bunch of stuff to it. So basically, uh, here, I've got it going from here to here. And this is gonna be my render output or, or ground or whatever. And from there, I want to do uh, the simplest, just straight up uh, ball rolling down the hill simulation. So this would be the equivalent of the bouncing ball that you might start with with animation. And here it's a ball rolling down a hill. Okay. Um, and then the, the little tiny thing I'll touch on at first is that um, here it's much lower resolution than what we just saw. So uh, I see a lot of people when they're starting Houdini get into trouble because they feel like they have to bring in these giant photorealistic assets and get something to work with that. And, and FX is all about tricking the eye. So here, yes, I've got the, the sphere, but um, I don't need a high res ground for it to roll on. So I've just done a few things here, uh, lots of procedural tools, very simple tools to just create a simulation based off of simpler parts. And that can work through my shot very efficiently. Okay, so we've got that and we've got our rolling simulation. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. There we are. Okay. So it started there, and here we can see the rolling simulation. All right, so what's next? Well, next, I could go into any of these other areas, and we can see how this simulation is flowing into maybe some other simulations, maybe some rendering, all that sort of thing. So um, I also see people coming from other packages, and they're really locked into uh, trying to get everything to work in one simulation like you would be forced to in somewhere else. But I found that in working with effects, one of the really amazing things, really freeing things is that there's such a flow. So I do one simulation, then I base uh, that simulation off of something else and then something else. And I can, I can really kind of just uh, follow the flow of dependencies and really work on specific elements. So let's go through some of those elements. Um, all right. So the first thing is this sci-fi effect. And I want to highlight why in this methodology, it's not always good to do a simulation. All right, so here's some sci-fi effects. And I'm going to dive in here. It's kind of like a folder in an operating system. Uh, here you can see I'm doing all my work in here and I'm rendering with this. I really want to get across how people actually use Houdini and not some flashy tutorial, but just this is how people actually use Houdini. Okay, so I've got all my hard work in here and here. These are just containers for rendering the various things uh, with the right shader and, and things like that. So diving in here, this is really where the meat is. This is where the, the main part would be. And I'll just kind of walk us through that. So I'm merging this in from another place, uh, making some directions out of these polygons. It's being stored on the geometry as a normal. And here I'm just... Uh, copying some points in the same transform as my circle. Okay, I'm giving them an ID, just like a particle would have an ID. And if they're um, uh, being, uh, here I've got some logic. So they're only being active if they're on the top half of the circle. Let me get the circle back up here, the sphere. Okay, there we go. 
So they're only really being active if they're on the top half, and they're being, their value is being held after that. Now I'm only isolating the top half of these uh, points and uh, doing a few more uh, kind of, I think, directional things here, just kind of like wiggling around the directions. Uh, also with my normal, I'll briefly run through that again. Uh, directionality going through, uh, little points scattered on the, the sphere. Here I'm highlighting uh, when they should be emitting some electricity, isolating them when they should be electricity. And here I'm just making some copies of the simplest things like a line. Okay. All right. So we got that. And uh, right now I've not done any simulation. So basically uh, there's a time and place to do a simulation, but it's really uh, kind of fun to get into instances where you don't really need a fancy simulation to get uh, a pretty cool effect. And so they're much, much faster. So the next thing I'm doing is I'm colliding with a ray operation, these things onto the ground here. All right, so I've, I'm doing some interaction with another object all without a simulation. You see how fast that is, uh, even on an older system. All right, and uh, here, making some more resolution. And finally putting in uh, some of the good stuff that's going to make it all come together. So I'm just blending between um, this guy and this guy, uh, these positions. And so I'm doing some blending. You can see it kind of looks like a spider or something. And then here I'm wiggling the lines around, very simple stuff. All right, so that's my final output lightning for or electricity uh, for this catalyst. All right, and then finally, just following that system up with another system that will just isolate out uh, only the points where it's touching and cause some sparks. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, so the final result of that, um, it's flowing into the rendering objects where it has its shader and, and everything like that. Let me hide the ball here. All right, so here, here's the final result that we can see. And it really didn't take long to simulate at all. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll briefly dive through a few of the other ones here. Okay, so here's a faster one. All right, so here's some growth effects. All right, so pretty much the opposite of, of something like destruction or, or electricity. And you might say, okay, gosh, that must be a heavy simulation. Well, it's not really that much of a simulation. The only thing it's doing is it's just increasing values if it touches. And one thing I'll bring light to here is that uh, we can kind of do work independently of time. It's, it's a really powerful thing to do once you get to the more intermediate phases of learning how to do this stuff. So basically, I've got a similar thing to the last method. I've got a bunch of points that are just being scattered this time all throughout the sphere. And I've got my ground here once again. So the thing I'm doing is I'm just looping through time. Um, this is time independent, yes, and this is time dependent, no. So basically, I've looped through time and gathered both where it's going to touch and also what frame it's going to touch at. So I've got a time uh, piece of data saved on my geometry. So there's all the times that this, uh, these points are going to interact with this. And from there, um, it's just basically the same as the lightning setup. I'm scattering some stuff. Uh, I'm giving it some more data for different things. Um, in this case, I'm just like making an animated uh, setting to cause it to grow over a duration of two. And out of each of these things, they'll either be a blade of grass or a flower. Okay. And it's splitting off grass and flowers. Here it's outputting flowers um, with a simple tool I made. It sounds simple. Um, yeah, it's just a uh, something to 
uh, a custom node that I made specifically to grow a flower. Okay. Or it's doing some grass. All right. And then finally, I'll just quickly dive into some destruction. It takes, it's a little bit uh, more simulation intensive. Like lots of people working on the same effect. So lightning effect or, or some other effect. And we're going to have this effect over and over again every time we do a, a, a broadcast or a movie or something like that. So what I envision for a, because I, I have seen the Indian production studios and I have seen the market there. And what I envision as Houdini use increases is that one person or two people that really know Houdini, maybe the so-called seniors, will be developing um, the system behind an effect like this. And they'll always be making the particles better. They'll always be making the lightning better and give you some controls. And then the, the less experienced people with Houdini, all they would have to do is just load in uh, that tool that they made. This call could all be just one tool. And all they'd have to do is adjust the settings. So we could be hammering away. Uh, at first, it wouldn't see a time savings when you're developing and getting the tool ready. But eventually, just huge, huge, huge amount of time savings. And it would always be the top quality because it'd always be the same setup. OK, so let me dive into the ground effects here. And as far as destruction and rigids, I mean, Houdini's really, really primary focus is all, is really exploited uses of simulation. So it can simulate everything uh, to a really high degree of realism and accuracy. And I really wouldn't want to be using anything else as far as simulation goes. So here is a simple ground simulation. So it's going to isolate the region that is going to be active. It's going to uh, s uh, do a pre-simulation of the ground underneath falling apart. Then it's going to release these things at a certain time. And then finally, it'll spawn some, some more rocks that are rigid body simulations. And then finally, off of all that, it'll spawn some particles. And almost there. I'll show the uh, this thing again here. So we want a few different layers of simulation here. We want uh, we want the ground pulling apart, these pieces collapsing, and we want some uh, some rocks based on the impulse uh, to be doing that. Okay, so here's that, and I'll just guide us through that a little bit. Okay, so here I've just got the active ground. I don't need to simulate the entire ground, uh, just the active ground. There we go. There we go. Okay, um, here it's just one piece. It's just a, a static piece of geometry, so I can do this all day. It's just one thing because I've already pre-baked the time. Uh, here's some particles that are spawning off of all of the stuff happening there, and I've got some large chunks that are actually being simulated with rigid body dynamics. Okay, so for the very last uh, minute or two here, I want to change the the input and we can see the effect changing in the same way that we would change it uh, if we were working on a different shot or if we were working on a different movie even like a few months later uh, we just read the same thing in and improve the tool and change the input okay so let's start with sci-fi here i'm going to go up here and i'm going to go to my objects that i would have imported so here i've got my sphere but maybe I want two spheres instead, or maybe I want a rounded box. Okay, so let's try the two spheres. And maybe for the ground, I want something completely different like this. Okay, so that would break just about any either poorly made setup or pretty much any setup in another application. You need not lots of little catches and lots of tweaks and, and all kinds of stuff, but I really think you're gonna see the power of using uh, Houdini for effects or general proceduralism uh, when you engineer really straightforward workflows and simple and and simple adding complexity effects to changing inputs here. 
So here I've got the sci-fi effects. And let's see that simulate. So it still works. We've still got some sparks. We've still got some electricity. It's still finding the right places on the on that. And uh, because I got the, the screen cut off, I'm going to go one more minute into the Q&A as I finish up here. Uh, I'm going to turn on the growth effects here. It's got to pre-bake the, uh, the rolling simulation, but that's a very quick simulation. And, and we can see the same system uh, working with completely different terrain, completely different spheres, and reasonably fast, especially for this computer, is simulating a completely different effect. So that's the amount of turnaround that you can have. That's the amount of power you can have by using proceduralism and using node-based, network-based procedural software, and Houdini, of course, is the best with that and with, with simulation. So that's really how Houdini is used. Uh, this is, um, you know, you can see a lot of flashy tutorials where you do something that's giant that blows up and everything so specific to that. But I think that um, just the low level flow of geometry and gradually increasing the plasticity, that's really how Houdini is used. And uh, that's how I recommend you learning Houdini. If you're learning Houdini, that's how I recommend implementing Houdini into a pipeline if you're doing that. So that's what I've got to share today. Thanks for uh, listening in. Sorry about the dropout of the screen. I hope you got the idea, and I'll share this, this uh, scene file for anyone that's interested. I'm going to see what kind of questions we have here. Okay. Yeah. So we have some questions from our end, uh, Mr. Andrew. So, yeah. So what is the future of Houdini ethics? Uh, the future, yeah, I mean, the future of Houdini effects, it's just getting uh, more and more modular. So modular meaning it's getting broken up into smaller and smaller pieces or more and more pieces. So uh, just fire is becoming its own special area. Just smoke is becoming its own special area. Just destruction and many different areas of destruction is becoming its own special area. Um, it's also branching into other fields like um, character effects, cloth and hair simulation. So that's its own special area now. It's very powerful. Um, so it's it's really just they they haven't actually changed the software that much since 1995. Like it's still the same core of the software, but they just keep building on it and building on it. It's getting more and more powerful and more and more specialized into all these different areas. Does that make sense? I hope. Yeah. yeah. So. Is there any uh, best free study resource available on internet for studying Houdini effect? Um, I mean, that really depends on the learner. So, uh, it, best uh, the the best. Um, what was the first word you said there? The best. Um, yeah. Is there any free study resource that is available on the on the internet uh, to study Houdini effect? Sorry, one more time on that. Mm -hmm. Is there any free study resource that is available on internet to study Houdini? Uh, free, free. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, um, you're going to find, so in my experience, you're going to find a lot of variation there. So uh, there's, there's the, that's a, that's a hard question. So, so basically you're going to find a lot of little short things uh, that are free on the side effects website. Now, uh, the quality of those things could be very good, all right? So you could have some expert that just had a, a thing they were really focused on and or uh, someone that uh, maybe through side effects itself, the company itself, um, was like kind of, uh, you know, maybe they, they gave them a little bit of incentive to put together something really cool in an organized way. But then you're also going to have just lots and lots of, of stuff where people are kind of just trying things. They're not really explaining it. Uh, so it can be very overwhelming and confusing. So when my students come to me, they have often seen maybe one or two good ones, but nine or 10 things that were worse than just learning from the help file. So I really recommend that you, you balance out, um, you know, the way I learned Houdini, there was one PDF file for, well, tutorial for Houdini. There was no video tutorials for Houdini when I was learning. 
And I really uh, suggest that uh, pick a project and then try to find the tutorials that are directly kind of um, helping you with your project. Don't just say, I'm going to learn Houdini because no one can ever learn Houdini. It's too big. When I, I, I know less Houdini now than when I started 20 years ago because it just keeps growing and we're only human. We're only one person. So pick your focus area and try to find the free stuff that's based off of that focus area. So how is Houdini different from Maya? Nice. Well, I hope I hope the demonstration um, showed a little bit about how it was different than Maya. Uh, I really think the future of animation software is going to be things like Blender. Uh, so you're, there's always going to be a need for software you can get in, select stuff, animate, model. There's always going to be a need for that, and I would not be using Houdini for that. Uh, what I would be using Houdini for is everything after that. So once the assets and the animations are made, I'd use it for crowds, I'd use it for cloth sims, I'd use it for destruction and all the effects we saw because it's about the flow in Houdini. It's like a pipeline and an operating system within a software. And Maya's not even close to that. It's, it's, a, it's a package where you can get in and model and animate. Houdini is a giant world uh, where you can do almost anything with graphics. So there's, there's really no similarities <laughs> that much anyway, other than that they're both 3D programs. So. Um. That's it from our side. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us today. And thank you. An insightful session, even though we missed a little bit of your uh, slide, but it was uh, great. Thank First you. Up. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.